Hello. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Brian Clack, Director of the Humanities Centre, and I want to welcome you to this very special and uh, prestigious event in our semester's programming, the NAP Lecture, delivered today by our distinguished guest, Dr. Tiffany, Dr. Tiffany Lethabo King. The NAP Chair of Liberal Arts was established in 1995 by a generous endowment from the estate of Mary and Churchill Knapp, longtime supporters of the College of Arts and Sciences here at USD. The NAP Chairs contribute to the vitality of the liberal arts in the college by interacting with students, collaborating with faculty, and presenting public lectures, such as this one. Previous NAP Chairs have included Kathy Cohen, William Derezowitz, Linda Tuhiwai Smith, Mark Edmondson, and Catherine McKinnon. And now, to introduce our current NAP chair, please welcome someone whose tremendous contribution to the intellectual life of USD is praiseworthy in itself from the Department of History, Dr. TJ Talley. Excuse me. Uh, thank you so much, Brian. Um, this is incredibly exciting. So this is the culmination of really two years of effort on behalf of multiple departments. And I'm just really thrilled to be here on behalf of history, as well as Africana Studies, to a certain extent through the Decolonial Working Group. I'm just really thrilled um, to have Tiffany here. So um, as a scholar of, of blackness, of race, of colonialism, and indigeneity, we are thrilled and excited to be able to experience the knowledge and the insight and the generosity of Dr. King. So um, just to tell you a little bit about her, uh, Dr. Tiffany King is currently the Barbara and John Glenn Research Associate Professor of Democracy and Equity at the University of Virginia. She is faculty in the Department of Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies. King is the author of The Black Shoals, Offshore Formations of Black and Native Studies, which won the Laura Romero First Book Prize, and is a co-editor of the collection Otherwise Worlds Against Settler Colonialism and Anti-Blackness. And because she will not be the one to toot her own horn, it's important to point out that The Black Shoals is not only an important but deeply formative book that structures a lot of our debates about thinking about the intersections of blackness and indigeneity currently in the field. King is also a co-director at the Black and Indigenous Feminist Futures Institute, a project funded by the Mellon Foundation. King's research and programmatic work focuses on strengthening existing black and native relations and creating new possibilities for collaboration. She is currently working on a book project that attunes its senses to black and indigenous feminist and queer intimacies. So please join me in welcoming my dear friend and esteemed scholar, Tiffany King. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope folks are so well this evening. I'm gonna get my clock out and do a few things um, as I talk. So no one has to apologize for the weather. I had different expectations, but it has been a lovely stay and I'm in a really beautiful space. So I appreciate um, the accommodations and the invitation. So I have never, actually um, occupied or uh, taken on a post like this before. And I'd really like to uh, thank the Humanity Center for its continuing support of the NOP chair and for the invitation, TJ. And TJ is a wonderful interlocutor and great friend. So thank you so much for thinking of me and inviting me into your um, really generous and warm and I'm sure rigorous scholarly community. So. Thank you for welcoming me. And also, if Hosen is here and Lindy and Caitlin, thank you for all of your time and energy and effort, um, your patience with me with email and uh, all of your, your work to get me here and uh, make me feel at home. Uh, so thank you so much. Um, let me time myself. I'm still adjusting to the time change and I don't wanna be too rambly, so give myself some parameters. I'm going to share some vignettes from some forthcoming work and then also 
talk about a collaboration um, that TJ briefly introduced, the Black and Indigenous Feminist Futures Project um, at UVA. So I'll run maybe 30 minutes or so, and then I guess we'll talk to each other. So that's how it's going to go. Um, and I just click this. OK, we'll give it a try, see how it works. Can people hear me? I always feel so awkward trying to lean in. And this is OK? OK, good. This feels better. All right, so I'm going to do a little reading and a little talking. So as of late, my work has shifted to a consideration of black ecological subjectivity and black ecological desires. And what this has meant for me is sitting with how black people survive and make new kinds of futures by enacting what black feminist ecological thinkers like Kimberly Ruffin and Carolyn Finney have written about as various kinds of black ecological belonging and citizenship. So black desires and enactments of ecological belonging are ideologically disparate. And sometimes black desires for ecological belonging and kinship express themselves as a kind of ecological humanism. And what I mean by this is that sometimes they seek inclusion into a liberal repertoire of scripts and practices of responsibility and stewardship for non-human life um, often as an expression of settler and imperial mastery. And alternatively, there are forms of black ecological belonging and kinship that are enacted by black feminist, queer, and trans desires for relations that are more contingent and unfold according to the consent from land and indigenous and black peoples. So in my current work, I track multiple ecological desires uh, represented often in popular culture, specifically in depictions of black people on the land. And this afternoon, I will be thinking about landscapes um, as they're deployed as processes of representation, and more specifically how a few black uh, memorials, specifically one at UVA, and black land experiments attempt to naturalize and or upset common sense notions about black people's relationship with land. And the representations that I introduce require that we slow down and consider the stakes of each black land project, experiment, or landscape on its own terms. And I begin with the landscape of UVA that's pictured here. Um, and I've made a return to this place after 20 years. And in spring of 2021, UVA had a virtual dedication uh, for the memorial to enslaved laborers. And the memorial tells a particular story about black labor and the kinds of political claims that can emerge from the grounds of stolen labor. I will also talk about a new configuration previously mentioned of black and indigenous feminists at UVA to think about how this memorial and the landscape that is UVA itself can be rendered a shifting site that's uh, open, contingent, and ever alterable. And finally, I conclude the presentation with some black, queer, and trans land experiments that take as their starting point good relations with the land and indigenous people. So let me try. Oh, there we go. So in 1997, I stood with a friend behind the pavilions in the southeast corner of UVA's academical village behind the lawn. My friend Kibra gasped, and I shift my attention to what had caused her disquiet. She traced the imprint of two fingers in a brick. After years of listening to students recount their struggles to wade through the dense spiritual energy that saturates the plantation come campus in forms of racial aggression, occasional visitations from apparitions that crossed the veil and entered into our plane of existence at night. I found myself tired. There were literal ghost stories that uh, black students have uh, circulated. And I told Kibber that I vowed to never come back to the University of Virginia. <laughs> Two months ago, I called her after almost a decade to tell her that I was headed down 95 to start a new job as a faculty member at UVA. 
and we both laughed <laughs> and talked about how our ancestors had jokes. So, and we also talked about how you never say never because you never know what awaits. So this fall, I not only find myself back at the University of Virginia, but working in a pavilion. I work actually at the end of this uh, kind of tunnel, um, the end of these series of pavilions. Um, and where I work is very near the structure where Kibber and I slid our fingers into the depressions left by the enslaved's fingerprints. I've returned as the Barbara and John Glenn Research Associate Professor for Democracy and Equity, a return and a repetition with a difference. So there are some aspects that remain the same, almost like, live, almost like opening a living, breathing time capsule. The descendants of the Virginia gentry play polo on the weekends, race horses, and frat boys have found a way to don the same wasp uniforms of dock shoes and khaki shorts and polo or seersucker uh, shirts. It might be a very regional uh, kind of attire. But what is different is that there are less black students. Um, in 1998, there were, the population was about 11%. It's currently eight. The American Indian and Alaska Native student population remains under 1% at 0.3. The black bus stop, which was an important gathering space and black space making practice that uh, Claudrina Howard has actually developed a film about has been removed and there's a marker that stands in the place where black students used to congregate. However, a change in the right uh, direction is that the Native American Student Union's proposal to build a native and indigenous student center recently passed as a resolution with the student council. And as of 2017, the university now acknowledges the ancestral lands of the Monacan nation. It is a liberal and perfunctory method of diversity management, as most are. It does not fully reflect the intent, the process, or the desires of the Monacan nation. However, it is a negotiation that has changed the discursive landscape. Additionally, because of the efforts of black students in 2011, the memorial to enslaved laborers was unveiled in 2021. The memorial represents one kind of black desire for repair, incorporation, and a representational politics that demands that the university reckons with the legacy of slavery through the built environment, specifically the structures that the enslaved had a role in designing, erecting, and perfecting. And I want to start with a memorial as a way of thinking about landscapes that attempts to represent reparative action and potentially black incorporation into regimes of anti-black and anti-indigenous violence. So I'm going to play a clip that's about uh, four minutes. for us to continue to move forward and, and striving for equity and striving for change, we have to be able to talk about our past in a way that's really meaningful. And the memorial, I think, is a, a beautiful first step in, in starting that conversation. It's intended to be a space for reflection and healing. It's a space of truth telling. We want folks to bring classes here. We want folks to engage in that way. Slavery wasn't an experience that by any means should just be something in our past that we say happened and we can talk about it. We should help folks heal past that trauma and past the brutality of it. The first thing design-wise that greets you when you come into the memorial is this broken shackle image. It represents a freedom from physical bondage. There's a, the path towards the North Star, and that was the path towards freedom. And then a, a second path kind of aligns with the sunset on March 3rd, which is Liberation and Freedom Day. It is 80 feet, which matches the diameter of the rotunda, taking up that space that is so rightly deserved in honoring this legacy. There is a timeline of events that happen all the way through until Isabella Gibbons' death. And Isabella Gibbons was a member of the enslaved community, and she 
really took it upon herself to encourage reflection, encourage moving the needle towards equity and equality. And so her eyes were on the back of the mm. memorial. I would encourage everyone, if they can, come witness it in person, feel the stone, see the timeline, be here and be present and take a second to reflect, honor and encourage folks to move forward with that history. Good morning. My name is Alvin Edwards, and I'm the pastor of the Mount Zion First African Baptist Church here in Charlottesville, and I am a member of the President's Commission on Slavery and the University, for which I am thankful to be a member of. And I want to welcome each of you to the virtual dedication of the Memorial for Enslaved Laborers. I want to welcome you to the vision of the former president of the University of Virginia, Ms. Teresa Sullivan, and the Board of Visitors, then for institutionalizing efforts to recognize enslaved laborers' contributions. And I also want to thank the PCSU committee and President Ryan for continuing the rec this recognition. And I would also like to take this moment to acknowledge that the land we live, learn, and work on is the traditional territory of the Mon Monacan Indian Nation. We pay respect to their elders, both past and present, and additionally, we acknowledge and pay respect to the enslaved people who built and labored at the University of Virginia. I welcome you to join us and share in the experience as we memorialize, as we celebrate, as we commemorate and learn lessons of the contribution of people of color who were enslaved and yet helped to build this university community that we're thankful for. Now let us pray. Well, we can stay here, but I wasn't ready to move. And so I wanted to actually show this clip because I wanted to um, sit in and respect and not dismiss the very righteous organizing efforts of students, faculty, and staff in the community. And I wanted folks to get a sense of the kind of um, effective register of the video so you could hear and see and feel how a particular form of black desire is aestheticized and built into the landscape. And I also want to admit that much of my own biography keeps me connected to this compelling narrative and struggle for representation repair. I am descended from the enslaved who then became sharecroppers in Savannah, Georgia, who then became day laborers, maids, cooks, trade unionists, um, and finally a few became working middle class professionals with an office and decent benefits like myself. And much in my background makes it almost um, axiomatic to cling to a black laboring subject as the premier representation of black political agency on the landscape of US terror. Black labor seems to so neatly and precisely encapsulate the force of black life, struggle, aesthetics, and politics, antebellum, and post-Civil War landscape paintings feature and figure the black laboring subject. Black liberal politics deploy black labor as a site of incorporation into the nation. And black anti-capitalist and socialist traditions of black working class struggle position it as a site of revolution. And as of late, I've been compelled to sit with these varied and overlapping representations of black labor in order to parse a more layered understanding for myself. Methodologically, black geographic and black ecological scholarship and praxis provide robust ways of reflecting black labor as a constellation of relations of production, sites of capital accumulation, alternative socialities, fugitivity, solidarity, betrayal, and self-making by thinking carefully about landscapes like the one at UVA. In more recent work, I've interrogated the taken for granted valorization of black labor, farmer, and land steward in popular culture. Uh, more specifically, I've studied representations of the black farmer. You see folks from uh, the television show Queen Sugar and this kind of black take on American Gothic, right? Um, and the black mountaineer as figures that surface a fraught space of black ecological desire and subject making. 
for instance, in the show uh, Queen Sugar, which the still is on, I guess, the left, uh, if you're looking from your vantage point, I think through the reproduction of the black farmer and land steward is a subject that consolidates a settler worker desire for mastery and heteronormative incorporation into a nation of settler land stewards. This figure of the black farmer and land steward is particularly important now as black land projects proliferate alongside indigenous land back struggles. Claims to black land as a space of sovereign proprietorship often ride on the back of black labor. Black labor is a space of deep investment across the ideological spectrum. Labor, of course, is also a site to build people power. And given the attempts that many of our universities made to jeopardize our health and lives as workers during the pandemic, I will assume that most of us, uh, perhaps in the room, are either members of a union or part of efforts to organize university workers. As a Southern scholar who worked in Georgia, which is a right to work state, and now in Virginia, I was and continue to be a member of United Campus Workers. So during 2020 and 2021, uh, when universities in Georgia tried to force employees back to face-to-face -face work as COVID deaths skyrocketed, UCW's relentless pressure on the administration and the Board of Regents delayed plans to have faculty, staff, and students return to unsafe working conditions. So certainly organized labor saves lives. Uh, but conversely, the liberal ideological power of labor also fuels the ongoing production of the settler nation. So we heard rallying cries of COVID deniers and anti-maskers, uh, which often kind of uh, organize their voice around a call for the nation to get back to work. And the nation needed to reopen on the backs of workers and self-sacrificing patriots. Labor is a fraught space. Black studies scholars like Shona Jackson, Denise Ferrer de Silva, and Sylvia Winter have helped me reconsider the primacy of labor as a way of self-fashioning a proper human and a political subject. In her book, Creole Indigeneity, Jackson conceptualizes labor as a way of knowing and therefore performing the self as a modern subject who's an agent of history. Labor is an onto epistemology that helps the Afro and Indo-Guyanese subjects that are the focus of her study know themselves as modern Hegelian subjects and in some cases, modern Marxian laboring political subjects. The labor of the black and Indo-Guyanese national subjects work to erase the prior labor of Amerindian indigenous people in the Caribbean basin. So labor is an onto epistemic site of emergence in settler and franchise, franchise colonial context makes some subjects appear in the present while others recede into the past. And Jackson is concerned with when the category of labor as a human making onto epistemology serves to reproduce the exclusionary violence that is enacted in what Winter theorizes as her man too. And I track the same exclusionary violence in the recuperation of black humanity as enslaved labor on the landscape at UVA. While we see the emergence of a laboring subject who's owed a place in history and a debt, we also see a simultaneous erasure of Monacan life and the erasure of Monacan work. While we did see Reverend Alvin Edwards in the clip offer a land acknowledgement at the dedication ceremony, there was no mention of the contestation over the site, which I learned is a sacred site for the Monacan nation. The land is a pulsing living site of Monacan sociality, sacred ceremony, language, and culture making, and it's buried and displaced by a history of labor and debt owed. And I was having this conversation with a student, my black and uh, indigenous feminists, of course, yesterday when she talked about uh, um, a staff worker at Morven Farms who feels like she needs to mediate between black and indigenous people who also contest the Morven farm space. And my student was quite articulate in saying that it seems like the problem of black space making under the constraints under, under which the university actually gives parameters to black people to decide where to put their memorials, the onus always lands on black people to not disrupt Monacan placemaking practices when the university has not committed to 
any kind of attempt to redistribute land to the Monacan nation, right? So it can't be a black problem. So she was really, really um, astute, and I was so uh, grateful for her kind of pushing um, the conversation that direction, helping me think about this. So when I think about um, the Reverend's Prayer and I think about the act of displacement at uh, the memorial site, it does have some overlap with the liberalism of the work engaged by a group called the American Descendants of Slaves, or ADOS. And ADOS's claims to a debt and call for reparations requires the continuation of the United States in order to make both the acknowledgement and the repayment of debt itself possible. The US has to continue to exist. So additionally, other kinds of black labor and communities are faced in a memorial to prior black labor. So the black labor that made white progress possible is what can be celebrated here rather than the black labor that disrupted the progress of the plantation. The black work required to stage rebellions and acts of petite marronage at various scales remain barely visible at the space. These forms of petite marronage are merely implied if one is motivated to do the interpretive work. And I am also not sure of the role that black organized labor played in this process. Questions that I still have include, does this memorial allow the black facility staff, day laborers, and other exploited black workers to voice their demands? And if so, how? Labor also covers up other kinds of violence that constituted the institution and quotidian practices of slavery. So when I first visited the site, which is actually on the path that I take every day to my office, I couldn't shake the presence of a deep and abiding rage that at times broke through an otherwise tranquil ring-like structure on the landscape. I snapped a picture of a marker that I could not forget. I reached out to the historian and designer Mabel O. Wilson, who worked, on the, who worked with the student committee and design team at UVA, and I thanked her for the presence and story of the 12-year-old. There was something pressing that the 12-year-old girl needed to say about the quotidian terror that is required to keep the institution of slavery in place. When Professor Mabel Wilson and I communicated about the marker, she shared that a group of concerned educators and parents asked that the initial description of the attack as a rape be removed. When Wilson offered sexually assaulted as an alternative, that was also rejected. This request was ostensibly made for the sake of children who would visit the memorial, so we both asked for whose children. Now the visitor must read between the lines or the subtext of the word attack to infer the meaning and interpret the landscape of sexual violence. What interpretive methods do we need to overcome the effacements at hand? Effacing these forms of violence also work to dampen the ongoing efforts to abolish the structures that naturalize these forms of violence as a part of our everyday relations. Returning to this campus as a tenured professor and a co-director of the Mellon-funded Black and Indigenous Feminist Futures Institute, also known as BEEFY, I arrive with a different kind of capacity. I and my colleagues drafted a proposal with the landscape of UVA in mind. We thought about what the landscape at UVA and our analysis of it at the intersection of Black and Indigenous feminist analytics might make possible in this space. In our Mellon proposal, we wrote, in 1819, Thomas Jefferson founded the University of Virginia on the lands of the Monacan people. Owning and enslaving over 600 human beings during his lifetime, Jefferson established both his plantation estate at Monticello and the university through the brutal regimes of native genocide, theft of land and capital, and chattel slavery. In his 1801 inaugural address, Jefferson articulated ex expansion as a vital project for his administration and the country's future. In 1803, Jefferson dispatched the Lewis and Clark expedition. As an enlightenment thinker who owned slaves and stole lands inhabited by the Monacan people, his intellectual legacy, some of which is documented in notes on the state of Virginia, is shaped by the interlocking violence of settler colonialism and slavery. As such, the University of Virginia and its particular ethos and rationale guided 
um, by a version of universitas or Jefferson's version of universitas is shaped by genocide and slavery. The 2017 Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville and on the grounds of the university brought the brutal Jeffersonian legacies of anti-black and anti-indigenous racism into sharp relief. For years, the University of Virginia has attempted to confront the legacies of slavery and more recently, settler colonialism through a range of university initiatives like the 2013 Commission on Slavery and the 2017 Partnership with the Monacan Nation to develop land acknowledgement protocols and scholarships for Monacan students. The University of Virginia, as well as universities across the nation, typically approach the legacies of slavery and indigenous genocide through distinct compartmentalized and isolated efforts. While initiatives to address the specificities of anti-black racism and indigenous racism as unique forms of oppression that require specific modes of redress are necessary, the need for an intersectional analysis of these twin legacies of genocide and slavery is essential. Scholars in the humanities and social sciences have argued that scholarship focusing on the histories of the Americas, specifically North America, must contend with the intersection of slavery and settler colonialism. And we wrote that it is for this reason that scholars at UVA envision an intersectional studies collective that would promote interdisciplinary feminist research, community building, scholarship, and cultural production at the intersection of black studies and indigenous studies. As an intersectional studies collective, the project's approach to developing curriculum, pedagogical resources, and scholarly community would be explicitly feminist. Academic intersectionality's origins in black, indigenous, and women of color feminist intellectual production animate our project's vision, goals, and design. Our intersectional studies collective will accordingly design pedagogical approaches modes of scholarly analysis and resources that would help expose the often buried conditions of possibility that structured Jefferson's sexual assault of enslaved women like Sally Hemings. Similarly, our project design would pose questions like, how did Jefferson's procurement of land for Monticello and the university reorganize the Monacan people's everyday lives along the axes of gender and sexuality? Muskogee Creek scholar Sarah Deer chronicles the history of settler sex trafficking of indigenous women in US expeditions west. We thought here of Sacagawea forced to take the trek with Lewis and Clark. However, she's a figure that does not emerge on tours of UVA's fraught history. Slavery is often sheepishly mentioned, but not indigenous genocide, forced marches, and sexual violence. Coloniality, which includes indigenous genocide, settlement, and slavery requires and keeps uh, hidden the way that it thrives on the production of normative European bodies and the destruction of black and indigenous bodies. As a result of these intersectional queries and approaches, faculty and students at UVA and beyond could connect classroom discussions of sexual violence on campus to the sexual and gender-based violence of slavery and settler colonialism that laid the foundations of the institution where they study. Can the 12-year-old enslaved girl, Sacagawea, Sally Hemings, and ongoing sexual terror come into view alongside uh, continuing labor struggles at the memorial? What are the rubrics? What are the theories and methods that we still need? More importantly, what are the conversations that we need to have and what are the relationships that we need to build? Casey Jernigan, Choctaw scholar and co-director of BFE, wants to bring the Native American Student Union and the Black Student Union together to organize a powwow and ceremonies at the memorial. As both communities and their relationship to the land are acknowledged, what mutual desires, needs, and visions will be articulated there. How might the man landscape change? Beefy's approach to intersectionality focuses on relation as a key heuristic. How do we hold blackness and indigeneity in relation to one another at all times? And how do we live in this tension and the new relations that it produces? How do we stay humble and open to the capacity for change? The humility and capacity for change are commitments that black, queer, and trans-led land experiments are honing as of late. I've been thinking about the experiment um, 
or to experiment in contradistinction to the project as functioning in part as a conditional tense that speculates. It hopes for something, something not pinned down, and it's conditioned by an if. The if is premised on an ethical relation and the inevitability of change. The experiment is a state of entanglement, responsibility, and perhaps consent. I'm looking for a better word than consent. I end this presentation with a reflection on two black land experiments, one in proximity to Muscogee Creek uh, Mounds in southwest Georgia, and one in the ancestral lands of the Cherokee and Green Mountain in North Carolina. While located in very different ecologies, they both center black and indigenous queer and trans futurity. During one of their last talks in 2020, as an academic before they returned to the land full time, Trevor Ellison spoke about the land-based experiment dodecahedron located on the ancestral lands of the Muscogee Creek. A part of Ellison's motivation for building the space for black and indigenous, queer, non-binary, and trans folks was their awareness of the recent uptick in black farming and black land projects. They talked about their concern that black and indigenous, queer, non-binary, and trans folks have been left out of or not intentionally considered in building recent land projects. Many black land projects are being incorporated into rather than disrupting settler capitalist orders based on racial capitalism. The constellation of interest ideas, projects, and politics currently being called black ecologies are not all the same. Ellison intentionally designed dodecahedron outside of the logics of the nuclear family, inviting black and indigenous queer and non-binary folks to a space of respite. Additionally, dodecahedron explicitly declares a right of return to Muscogee Creek and indigenous peoples. Good relations with indigenous people, Muscogee and people in particular, is a part of its abolitionist and decolonial ethos. Jumping scale in this way, dodecahedron imagines and calls forth a black and Muscogee and indigenous futurity built on relationality and the anti-colonial politics of land back that might align with Lara Harjo's geographies of Muscogee emergence. Finally, located in Green Mountain, North Carolina, Medicine Bowl, founded by healing justice practitioner Kifu Farouk, began with a conversation with her friend and Cherokee herbalist and organizer before acquiring the 142 acres on the side of the mountain. The experiment started with consent um, from the members of the Eastern Band of the Cherokee and Medicine Bowl's mission to bring black, queer, trans, and formerly incarcerated folks to the mountain is an experiment in black futurity that begins with the assumption of indigenous futurity and healing. In this sense, Medicine Bowl's experimental future now works in a conditional tense or mode. Over the next three years of BP's programming, some of our work will be devoted to gathering with black land projects and indigenous organizers working on various projects that fall under the umbrella of land back. We look forward to being engaged in what the Red Nation has named as their own commitment to collaborative study with black relatives around land, land use, and our changing relationships with one another. Over the next three years, Beefy also intends to walk with one another to prioritize black and indigenous relationship building. As I approach collaborative study, my partner asked me to slow my pace so I can interrogate my own projections and fantasies for they can cloud or refract things in certain ways. She asked about Mayan Kibber's assumption back in 1997 that the bricks actually entombed the fingerprints of the enslaved in their labor. The prints could have recorded the labor of free blacks or even Monacan laborers. The bricks could also tell a story about the land and its properties. For instance, the clay of the bricks could move us into geological time. The soil could hold stories of the intimate relations that black and Monacan people had with one another. This advice to temper my own desire and reflexive response to black labor reminds me that the activities, people, and dynamics at any given landscape of labor are not self-evident. There's concrete labor that we certainly need to account for and stories and fictions of labor that we are deeply invested in that we hope point us to the laboring people, histories and politics that guide our futures. We often want it to point us to a specific place and resolution. I want my labor to be more patient 
In the work of black and indigenous solidarity, friendship, and hospitality, I seek a labor that pauses and breathes as it attempts to create and recreate with each other over and over again. I thank you so much for your attention this afternoon. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. OK. All right. Uh, hi. Hello. Hello, friend. Hi, Professor um, Tali. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Tiffany, this is beautiful. And it makes me feel a lot of things and have to think about my own complicity in the way that I move through mm. space and how I can't just be like, oh, I'm a magical black person. I can't think about the many complications of settlement and labor. But one of the things I wanted to hear a little bit more from you about is this semester I'm teaching a course called African Feminisms. And one of the courses, and my students are the best, and if you're here, you're the best. Um, but one of the things that we think about a lot are sort of um, the conditions of when we think about um, feminist practice and feminist agency and feminist life. And so what I wanted to hear more about um, from you about from Beefy and from and what's happening here is how would you label and discuss how these practices are explicitly sort of um, feminist practice or through feminist agency? What, what marks them as part of being shaped by um, feminist practice? And how does this look like it, as it plays out for you? What are the mm -hmm. stakes? What are the stakes? Yeah. Yeah. So I'll start with the landscape and then move out, for instance, and talk about some of our other work. I'm gonna sit down. But no, thank you for that. How do feminist practices play out, particularly around these questions of black and indigenous relations, or maybe even an ethic of how we treat each other? And I appreciate, for instance, one, um, Casey, who does a lot of the work, is our kind of liaison with the Monacan Nation, um, specifically Teresa Pollock, um, you know, brings back the concern about the way that people talk about the memorial in a very kind of uncomplicated way, right? And she's like, well, the memorial should absolutely be here, but we haven't had broader conversations about the actual space is a living, pulsing, breathing space that's important to the Monacan Nation, right? And so how can the Monacan Nation also be a part of that space? And so we do have, well, this particular Monacan student graduated who was the person that Casey was working with to talk about um, a Native American student union sponsored and black student union sponsored powwow, right? Which. As we know, if we listen to the student in the video, right, students are organizers and they're always responding to the political climate and the moment. And this is a post um, 2016, post stop cop city kind of moment where there can be adjustments, right? So students will continue to think, particularly black students might continue to think about how to remake the memorial space, right? And how to actually, um, incorporate the Monacan Nation, Monacan students into remaking that space, right? There's a way that particularly with people like Mabel Wilson who do design, that designs don't have to be permanent, they can also be changing. If there is a true intention there to work in, um, our university likes words like democracy. <laughs> so in democratic and equitable ways, that space can be under revision, right? Um, something else that has just happened is Beefy is having a gathering in June to get all of our intersectional studies collective members together. And the space that I mentioned earlier, Morven Farms, it's kind of you know, wringing its hands about how much space, so strange that black people's stories take up on the landscape, right? As if they could not also um, give the land back to the Monica Nation and also have that be a space that is peopled by, reanimated by Monacan life. When we approached them about their fee, um, which was out of our budget at the time, we said, you know, given the spirit of our work, could you waive the fee? And so they're actually working on their first um, fee waiver template to host us and a fee waiver template um, that will waive fees for black and indigenous folks who want to use the Morgan space. So um, 
it's not land back, but I'm thinking about, um, we were reading Max Lebron's Pollution is Colonialism and the way that Max was thinking about, Dr. Max was thinking about, you can't approach institutions as things that are hard, right? She's like, there are certain times where there are um, opportunities to push something depending on the person who's there, right? Depending on the political climate, events that have happened where you can make that institution a little bit more malleable, right? And pliable, so. That's a particular kind of um, ethic that we've approached. I think it's kind of feminist ethos is um, organized and shaped and influenced certainly by a black feminist ethos, an indigenous feminist ethos of care and relation, right? A particular kind of commitment to relationality that um, many uh, indigenous feminists speak about, particularly as a, a as we're thinking about it from what sovereignty can look like, right? A deep generative kind of relationality. So I think we're trying to practice that. So yeah. Thank you, thanks. It's good to get to talk about some of what we're doing, for sure. Oh no, I'm leaning really heavily on <laughs> That would be such a disaster. And take your time, yeah, absolutely. I'm curious about the practical um, application of giving land back to indigenous peoples, not only in uh, America, but yeah. in the whole world. Mm -hmm. um, like, would it be okay, for example, for the North Africans to request the like Arabs to give back their mm. like land? Like the Berbers, for example, of Morocco, mm -hmm. um, should they require the Arabs to give the land back? as well, or like even Europe, could the indigenous, like maybe Gaelic um, mm -hmm. peoples or the Celtic peoples, would they require mm -hmm. like the European countries to give them their land back? Yeah. I mean, I don't have specific answers for that and that kind of decolonial struggle, or specifically anti-colonial struggle, which demands land back and decolonial and the Eve Tuckin, uh, Wayne K. Yang sense, um, is really what that looks like is determined by the context and the, the place, right? So that gets worked out locally um, with specific indigenous nations who occupy that space. So you would literally have to be in those places um, in those negotiations to understand what that would even look like and what the demand would be. There is a organization that, it's Dr. Joanne Barker is a board member of, Sigorite Land Trust, right? That's closer to you than me, because it's on Ohlone lands, and they have workshops, you can actually go to YouTube, and they are committed to land back, but they actually work with people in a number of ways. So there are workshops they have posted that work directly with um, white settlers who have committed to um, not passing down their uh, wealth, specifically property or land to their children and instead giving it to the trust, right? So that's a particular way that's been talked about, discussed, People have been trained, people have been in relationship with one another, so there are writing projects to help people write through their relationship to land, write through their sense of possession to help change it. There was a beautiful conversation that happened with um, a white woman who was, who had created a beautiful kind of artist center, and she was like, I was really resistant about this, not because I'm not politically down with land back, but she's like, I just really had to think about could I age in place, right? I'm a person who is now considered an elder. I love this place, I love my community. And the particular indigenous nation there was like, well, we wouldn't wanna displace you, but there's a way you can change your relationship to property, right? And they actually have to use the tools of property law, right, tax law, to reconfigure her relationship to it and create a different kind of access for indigenous people. So it's a really particular and specific question that doesn't just have to do with the territory where you are, the indigenous people, but also the ways those conversations have happened with the, the settlers that occupy it. So it's gonna look different depending on the context. And there are multiple kinds of stories and um, even multiple, as I was talking about the different kinds of ideological <laughs> bents to uh, 
black land projects. There are multiple ideological uh, debates about land back, right, within indigenous communities. So um, there are specific examples you can go to to kind of see how people have worked it out, but there's no universal or pat answer for what that looks like, you know? I see. Well, it I happens in real a, time. A better answer, like, uh, I hope that one day we'll have like a concrete way to find out. Yeah. But, but thank you. I sure, thank you for the question. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, really excellent Good talk, afternoon. thank you. Um, the, the video gave a lot to think about, about the memorial, right? yeah. bright production value. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, I was, this is, the, the question's kind of originating in something I saw in the video, which mm. when they pan out to the circle of grass, it really looks like a sports field. Mm. You said uh, a sports field? Yeah, like a, you know, a circular version of like, a football field or like a soccer field. Um, and it started making me think like, is this like a game? Is the, you know, like the problematics of college sports, kind of the, the labor that's involved in NCAA, all of that mm -hmm. stuff. Obviously the circle complicates that because that's kind of a different, you know, like a symbolism, a different kind of placemaking and circularity of it. Yeah. Um, but then coming to this talk, it was advertised as a conjuring. You were gonna, like that was in the the advertised, um, the alchemies, the conjuring, the um, decolonial, yeah, um, yeah. the fourth, the red and black. So, so yeah. it made me think: what is the role of the ritual versus like that? That kind of connoted like a game for me, like the gamification of DEI in the sports. But what kind of mm -hmm. rituals are part of your conjuring, mm -hmm. your philosophy, the decolonial process? Um, you mentioned healing justice, which incorporates a lot of ritual practice. Mm -hmm. um, but I wanted to know, you know, what what kind of rituals and playful elements are at mm. kind of the root of your your conjuring project that you want yeah. to do as part of decolonization and the like. Thanks. Thank you for reminding me of that book title that I I don't know I'm committed to. I actually forgot that I gave you that title. <laughs> Way to hold these scholars accountable. You said you're gonna do a thing, yeah. No, but I can still answer that uh, through emerging scholarship that might not touch on those themes of alchemy and conjuring, but you're right, there's something about when you said the manicured kind of grass, grassy space, I thought about the kind of aesthetic process of covering over and concealing um, much of which many people have argued is a continuation of the afterlife of slavery, the ways that black athletes are exploited on campus. And I don't know if people were aware, kept pace with the news about the mass shooting in November. There have been so many mass shootings that, um, the mass shooting that took the life of uh, Devin, um, Lavelle and Deshaun, who were all football players who, um, I had never met, but I see their image all over the place, right? I see likenesses of them, I see their numbers, um, and they stand in as particular kinds of symbols um, of a particular kind of black masculinity, but also particular kinds of commodity forms that the university has owned. And there's also a cover-up of hazing, of systemic hazing that has gone on at that university that um, has not come out, and uh, the black, primarily male-identified men um, have not been able to be heard around the kind of violence they experience as student athletes. So there is a manicuring effect, and the aesthetic practices of landscaping on UVA cover up a multitude of things. And so one of the things that we experience, meaning Casey, Sonia, and I, her co-directors of Beefy, is a kind of unspoken violence that you feel, right? So the memorial brings it up, right? So we continue to work with um, fingerprints and bricks around us. And so one, we um, invited two fellows. So we have a fellow in residence program we invited uh, Jody Bird, uh, the author of Transitive Empire, and Sharon Holland, who wrote Raising the Dead, to kick off our institute, we 
knew that the landscape, um, the landscape there affected people, particularly affected black and indigenous people. So the first day we did um, medicine bundle and sacred bundle making, right? So um, to think about um, indigenous and native people in this hemisphere who use medicine bundles and also people from the African diaspora, specifically thinking with uh, Congo-based and Haitian-based sacred bundle-making practices, and did that as a form of protection in a way that we, we also had a walking practice around campus led by Marisa Williamson, who's an artist who's also a member of our um, beefy intersectional studies collective who took us to um, sites and, and particularly some grave sites that are not acknowledged by the university of people who are part of black communities. And we went to visit a space called Canada that um, Isabella Gibbons uh, ancestors were a part of and laid flowers. So those are a part of our ritual making practices. And we laughed and told jokes. We're planning on doing some um, inviting some black and indigenous comedians and writing bits and, uh, and jumping in and laughing. That's a part of uh, the ritual play, right? So um, I think I engaged some of your questions and thoughts, okay, and concerns. Yeah. Hi. Hi how <laughs> you are had you? a very nice speech, and um, I just wanted to say thank you for sharing a lot of things that I um, didn't know before, and mm. I definitely had a blatant bias too. And mm. without yeah, yeah, yeah. you speaking on a lot of these topics, I don't know if I would have um, been exposed to them just in society. So thank you. Mm -hmm. And also, talking about landscape, I was thinking about USD's landscape, and we mm. have a building called. Um, I apologize if I say this wrong, but St. Tekawitha and Sarah Hall. And there was actually a meeting about two, three weeks ago about the renaming of it. And um, you talked a lot about femininity and indigeneity and how important that is. And um, St. Tekawitha, she was in a lot of senses a great um, feminist leader in native life. However, for the Kumeyaay people, which is this is Kumeyaay land on, yeah. she does not represent um, their ideal. She actually represents the colonial um, conversion into Christianity and she represents that. So I was just wondering, what's your say on naming of these individuals who, to many communities, she may be a figure of respect, but to the Kumeyaay people of this land, it doesn't represent that. So how can we go about um, doing memorialization in a way that doesn't strip the identity of the people who were here before them? Okay. I mean, that's something we struggle with on Monica and Lanza EVA and one of the reasons why the Native Indigenous Relations Council has been formed is because we've gotten it wrong so often on issues like naming and renaming. And so that I don't know what a similar Indigenous Relations Council looks like here at USD. Um, so I, you know what? Our Native and Indigenous Relations Council has students involved, and I don't know if there is one here or if it does invite students, but you might want to get in on those conversations and negotiations and see how that plays out, and particularly if they're in conversation or, or invite um, a community people to be a part of that conversation. It's an important space to be, particularly to be an ally, right? Um, so again, similarly, like I can't answer that question. Like it's just, um, an in situ and milieu kind of, you gotta be in it, right? And working through it. And, and you can change it by being in it, right? It's a dynamic uh, in live space, so yeah. So do that, do that research, right? And see where you can get involved and find out more, for sure. Mm -hmm. Hi, Dr. King. Uh, thank you so much for the wonderful talk as well. Um, it's kind of cutting out. I was wondering what the place of militarism in your larger project is, because, oh, wow. I mean, obviously thinking about memorials, 
yeah. that's a big thing that comes to mind. And thinking about military uh, participation as a form of mm -hmm. labor in itself, like of statecraft, but also mm -hmm. of building these forms of like belonging. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was curious in the, and obviously that connects with like ecological destruction, a lot of these other um, concepts that came up within your talk. And I was wondering, again, what the place of militarism or uh, military participation is within the broader scheme or like where it comes up? Yeah. Um, I don't know that I'll even be moving in that direction beyond a superficial kind of way of naming it as a particular kind of violence, right? But in terms of, as Beefy tends to think about the kinds of landscapes that surround us and we are in an embodied relation to and an institutional relationship to, there is still an ongoing struggle around what to do with a lot of the Confederate memorials that were felled after that 2017 Unite the Right march. And so um, there are all kinds of proposals on the table that um, pay some kind of tribute or homage or try to continue to memorialize them even if they're not erected on the street, but in another place like in a museum, right? This particular um, desire to always um, surface this particular military history and this particular disciplinary regime of violence, right? That gets reanimated in 2017 and again and again and again in other ways, certainly through police presence um, in Charlottesville. So there is a group, um, Defund the Police works with Black Lives Matter in Charlottesville. Um, so there is a vibrant organizing community that is thinking about um, the increased kinds of, re the increasing resources that are going to police funds, the militarization of the police in Charlottesville. And I don't know that that's gonna make it into my scholarship, but it is certainly something that we will will probably come up in explicit ways as we continue to engage more of the, the black and indigenous or and black and Monacan organizers um, in Charlottesville through Beefy's work. But thank you for that. Thank you for helping me make those connections. Yeah, they are there. Mm -hmm. Hey, take your time. I just want to start by thanking you for coming here and thank you to the labor that went into bringing yeah, Dr. King you. here. This phenomenal talk and uh, I'm in the field of rhetoric and mm -hmm. in our discipline, um, your work is being circulated and read and it's been really informative and so I just wanted thank to you. let you know that that it's, yeah, Reach and TJ also shared your work with me. So in rhetoric, we also do memory studies and are thinking about memorials. Mm -hmm. And I recently was thinking about the equal justice initiatives, oh, wow. memorials that they have been doing. And I mentioned with TJ, they have a community remembrance project, which is really cool because it's is around coalition building hmm. within specific communities. And then the soil is dug up after three to six months. Yeah. You probably are familiar with it. And, but it doesn't recognize any indigenous relations or the land. And I think that's a shortcoming not only of that particular project, but other similar projects. And I'm curious mm -hmm. if you have examples or at least ideas of like what, what are some, what would make for strong mm -hmm. black, memori black indigenous memorialization? Are there examples that we have or all, are there qualities that you can speak mm -hmm. to of, of how that would be done well? Yeah, I'm familiar with uh, the EJI project in Montgomery where I visited and seen some of the, the collection of soil from different counties um, all over the nation. So one thing that I will say is that I also really trust uh, black communities to work this out. Like I've seen incredible shifts just in Atlanta since I left. So I know last week people may have been following the Stop Cop City and um, Forest Defenders fight that's happening outside of Atlanta. It's actually in very close to East Atlanta where I used to live. And so I remember when um, when I was living there before 
the space was supposed to, was, before there was even a plan to have the cops develop it, there were plans for a Walmart to be there, there were plans for some other kind of big box um, shopping center to be there. And that particular part of East Atlanta um, is contested for some other reasons that are not rising in the media, particularly if you're just watching Democracy Now! and that a lot of black people are being pushed out. So East Atlanta is where trap music emerged. So literally the um, apartment complex that I lived in, I became a part of the middle class upperly mobile gentry that moved into a, a place that was a former housing project where Gucci Mane used to live. So that place is becoming um, not my apartment complex, but the people who own it, their houses are from $500,000 to $700,000, and we're pushing out the black community who are closest to the forest, right? So that particular discussion has been removed from the media, right? So there is an ongoing fight against gentrification in a place that looks very multiracial, um, it's increasingly becoming white, right? And so there was very little discussion of um, that forest um, as uh, Muscogee Cree people's forest, right? Um, it was thought about as a public space, which for Atlanta in that area meant so white people and their children could have green space, right? And so that has shifted due a lot in part to um, black and brown and white organizers on the ground through um, particular groups like Song, um, Sister Song, Spark, right, who have actually been engaging um, indigenous activists from all over the country and in the South um, in ways that I've really found remarkable. I found that particular kind of political exchange and like banging for each other, particularly amongst black and indigenous people, really, really heavy in Canada, more so on the West Coast, but it's really picking up in the South and people are adjusting. So you just had um, a reverend, I think her first name is Kiana, but came out and signed a statement that the Muscogee Nation put out. And she's like, we're actually as clergy and as black clergy in support of the return of Muscogee lands, right? So this is happening in real time, right? And so that is um, a moving practice of memorialization to mark land in certain ways. And when I was there, I took part in a decolonial um, neighborhood tour that read Bike and Green, which was a play on kind of the black liberation flags, Colors, which was a primarily black, queer, and trans-led group that bikes around the city. And a lot of their space-making practices are to disrupt the colonial kind of mapping systems that make it make Atlanta a very difficult place for working class black people to live, that make it impossible for us to think about Muscogee presence. So they were doing kind of a counter monumentalization kind of process in their moving kind of marking of space, right, as black, uh, queer, and indigenous people, right? So um, I don't have advice. I'm actually taking direction, right, from what I'm seeing and what is actually happening in real time. And um, organizers are responding, and I think actually academics are kind of catching up, and we just got to be in the mix <laughs> rather than, like, give direction. So I'm really inspired by what I'm seeing, right, and particularly that particular kind of solidarity in that Black and Indigenous Alliance building. Like, it's, it's happening and it's strong. Yeah, it's inspiring. Hello, uh, thank, thank you so you. much for speaking to us. Um, and the other young lady's question sparked, mm. sparked um, oh my God, uh, thoughts. like my thoughts. Yeah. Uh, so we have a Kumeyaay garden um, mm. on campus mm -hmm. and I wouldn't have even known about it if it wasn't for one of my classes freshman year. Um, and so like the university hasn't done very much to make it prevalent in students' mm -hmm. lives. And so what do you think the role of universities are with these memorials to make them something that students can engage with instead uh, of them just becoming something that students walk by every day, um, right. kind of disregard? Right. No, I feel that, absolutely. And 
to make them be opportunities for a different kind of engagement, right? Um, with Kumiye, Kum, Kumaye communities? Kumiye communities, Kumiye communities. Thank you for that pronunciation. But no, I'm right with you and I can just say, yeah, I affirm, <laughs> I affirm what you're saying for sure. I wish there were more mics. It feels so formal <laughs> walking up to the church altar. <laughs> Thanks for being here. So I've been thinking about this question for quite a while, so I'm just making it cook in my head a little bit. Yeah. Um, and so in your work, you, you see quite a bit of um, sort of coalition building between black, indigenous, queer. Mm -hmm. um, and this sort of harkens back to a conversation I've had um, in my field as well, communication studies about, um, about for instance, BIPOC and how mm -hmm. it can sort of overlook differences, significant differences. Um, and so my question probably, which m might be wrapping up things here, um, mm. what in your work, what have you seen are specific maybe challenges or, product or productive tensions, which I like because yeah. um, you know, it keeps each of us on our toes in some way. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if you've maybe encountered some of the challenges or productive tensions and, and what have you maybe learned from it or what kind oh, oh, what can it tell us basically yeah so, tell, thank you yeah no thank you for that um your question and not the last question but the question before about rhetoric and memorials made me think about the way that not just bipoc works to perhaps um smooth out particular kinds of tensions or frictions, right, and ally differences, but also even the B in BIPOC, I'm thinking about the last example I was talking about, Cop City, um, hides some of the class tensions and divisions within black communities. So Atlanta, which people have literally called Wakanda, right, the special magical place where black people can be and do anything, um, Ex experiences that particular kind of black class conflict uh, particularly acutely. Um, so the last two mayors have been black people who are part of the middle class who have been the people who have carried the banner and the legacy of civil rights on their back, but a particular middle class civil rights kind of project that uh, debases, hates, and is very violent. I'm talking about murderous to working class black people, particularly if you look at the Rayshard Brooks case um, under the administration of a black mayor, Keisha Lance Bottoms, who had the white cops get off for murder, right? Black people feel very disrespected, and I'll refrain from using expletives, so have a very, very, very sharp class analysis. And so one of the things that I think working class black people are better about, and this is to your question, are actually better about thinking about uh, colonial practices, ongoing hundreds of years, genocide, Indian removal, right? Muscogee Cree removal specifically in ways that the black middle class who are in power don't want to because their alliance with corporations, uh, white business and the white upper class are very important to them, more important than the black working class, right? So that B overrides a lot as well. And also these particular kinds of class tensions I'm starting to learn about in Charlottesville, but one of the things that has become a problem, we have, there's a project um, that one of our colleagues, Amy Rose Fall, is involved in to build a black and indigenous garden. And it fell apart because of a particular white person who had a grant who wanted to dictate what that looked like. So, right, removing the particular kind of settler need to discipline and dominate has actually given the project some momentum again, right? So, also the extent to which, and we have to worry about this as an, insti as an institute in that we can't be, um, builders of a field and try to dictate what a field of black and indigenous feminisms would look like is we would also be disciplining certain people, right? So again, the ways that movements have been disciplined often don't allow the kinds of solidarities that black and indigenous people want. And they get disciplined through institutions like here in the University of Virginia and the Mellon Foundation, right? So knowing to, knowing how to have a relationship with 
organizers and, and share your resources or appropriate resources and give them to people is something that you gotta learn too, to not disrupt people's dynamic, innovative, or revolutionary flow, right? And, and being aware of those particular kinds of fractures and fissures, fissures in the B and the I, um, and the P and the O and the C of BIPOC is really important as well. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it.